uh, good morning, everyone. I hope it's been a great experience for you guys sitting through these sessions. That's uh, the most important. Um, love any feedback, by the way, once we're done. If you have any feedback, please do drop me a note and anything that we can do to make it better. Um, with that, look, I, I want to thank Vernon and, and Arun for um, you know taking the time. I know it's not just um, presenting here. There's a lot of work that goes into doing your research and putting all this content together to share it. But sorry, that is not... That is, my phone is on silent, but that's an alarm, apparently. Um, it was instructions from my wife or something. Um, so um, thank you, thank you, gentlemen, for that. I would like to take the opportunity now to introduce Nick. Um, and Nick is a, Nick has, well, Nick has been a partner for um, uh, a couple of very large global uh, law firms across Europe and, and, and um, Asia. He spent a significant amount of time living in Europe, in, in Russia specifically, and other parts of Europe, having done a lot of business, transacted a lot of business for his customers there, and now for the last four years in, um, in Asia and Singapore, and is very uh, experienced specifically in um, having implemented um, you know, blockchain-based um, um, integrations into some of their largest customers across a, a whole bunch of sectors. So it's a great opportunity for us to get uh, the technology standpoint and where we see the market heading with um, someone like Vernon and, and, and Arun presenting around that. But it would be great to get Nick's um, views on the commercial and legal implications of some of these things. And I was told to run a fireside chat. I had a different vision. I was telling Vernon I actually thought it, would it was going to be a couple of wing chairs and a glass of sherry in my hand. And, uh, but obviously it's breakfast, so we can't do that. So with that, Nick, I'd like to welcome you. And Vernon, last minute decision to get you on the hot seat as well. Uh, Where are we sitting? Well, yeah. Okay. All right. Hope you all wore decent socks. Um, all right. So. We were too close to each other. <laughs> we generally are. Um, is that all right? Okay. So, so Nick, I think there's been a lot of discussion around um, what's going on in terms of you know transformation and. Ado adoption across different industries with some of these technologies that we've talked about today. Um, Vernon, I mean, what I'd like to kick off with, I really like that slide that Vernon had, mm. uh, and there was a lot of use cases on that, practical use cases that have been put into place. I guess for the benefit of the audience, uh, especially the practitioners, it would be great to get a, a sense from you, from what you've seen, in terms of you know, the legal and commercial uh, aspects what's required to put these into place from a practical standpoint? Sure, yeah. Um, I think this slide is, is fantastic because it's, it's just the, the practical examples. I think the cases we look at, what, what you have to look at in the practical implementation in anything of this is, is, is the commercial and legal framework you're actually sitting in. Uh, and the problem with the legal framework is it's different in every single country you sit in. Um, when we talk about the technology and interoperability and all that sort of stuff, the, the, the point of failure is your legal and regulatory system because each country is going to have a different approach and your interoperability will be stopped when you come to that legal approach. The helpful thing is uh, that those, the interoperability that we're creating in the actual technology actually provide some of the answers to the interoperability of the legal systems because they can talk to each other. There are all existing frameworks. I think the best example is probably data privacy. There's been a number of different events over the time, but just watch what happened when the European Union introduced its later data privacy rules. Everyone goes, oh yeah, that applies to us and we're sitting in Australia. Uh, and and you, you have this global reaction to the same point. When you come to that intersection point that Vernon's talking about. Um, what we need to layer on from a legal point of view is the actual contract. And the helpful thing in most jurisdictions, most common law jurisdictions and some civil law jurisdictions, is, is a contract doesn't need to be in writing. A contract can be a handshake. Uh, and a contract can be code. Uh, and so when you look at the practicality of blockchain, what blockchain gives you uh, in the interaction between contractual counterparties is the nodes. 
So each of the contractual counterparties is a different part of the node, or, or a different one of the nodes in the system. Your regulator can be a different part of the node in the system. The customs authority can be a different part. Your logistics company can be a different part. So uh, that legal framework very nicely fits down over the top. And I think one of the use cases that Vernon highlighted um, is the MERSC study. And I think that's, that's a really good example of, of how multiple jurisdictions coming into a combination of blockchain, AI, and IoT with smart contracts can really change business process. Uh, so what MERSC did is they looked at containerized cargoes around the world and they, they did a couple of tests of different types of cargoes coming to Rotterdam from different parts of the world. Uh, the most interesting one is a container of freshly grown flowers from Kenya shipped to uh, Rotterdam. When you look at that whole chain of logistics, customs, ports, authorities, ships, it's a really slow process. So coming to Vernon's point, you know, the truck comes and picks up the flowers in the container, well, you, so you load the container, you know, all this takes time. A ship moving from uh, Mombasa and Kenya through to Rotterdam, that takes time. And so that's a perfect example to, to use to test it. The other thing is the shipping industry hasn't changed in 200 years. How you move cargo around the world has always been a letter of credit uh, and a bill of lading, and that has been the same system for hundreds and hundreds of years. When the MERSC looked at the number of bits of paper that you need to move one container of flowers from Kenya to Rotterdam, it was over 200 different pieces of paper. Whether that was a form to be stamped by the customs or the contract between the parties, the contract with the logistics company, the uh, payment instructions to the banks, all the different parts of that, that chain, that's highly inefficient. When you think about these big container ships now, there are hundreds and hundreds of containers on those ships. And if you have 200 documents per container, you're talking about millions of documents per ship. So the inefficiency of that as a process is just insane in the modern day. So what they did is they negotiated the structure with all the different stakeholders in that supply chain. And if I understand correctly, you might know better, they reduced the 200 documents down to something like seven. Um, they used uh, a blockchain structure for the smart contract. They used AI and IoT to follow where the container was at any one time and how it was cleared through customs. And that's just one example. Um, and I think the, the uh, back on that other slide, the, the Louis Dreyfus commodities one, uh, it was a different one that's dry bulk, it was moving soybeans. So uh, this isn't containerized cargo, this is dry bulk cargo. Um, and same concepts, same efficiencies. The, the more interesting thing is they, they brought in banks and trade finance into the structure. And that's where we move into the FI um, side of things, which I think we should probably talk about a bit more because that's when you start moving from slow to fast. And um, blockchain and uh, the, um, the, the, the trustless structure you can have within a permission system, um, it's not about the security, it's about the speed of execution and the confidence that you know what's happening. Yeah, I, I, I just want to add some, some points that Nick said there. That fr from a technology standpoint, we all assume that we're creating these um, vulnerabilities inside our, uh, our infrastructure by by having IoT data that was just all of a sudden exposed. And that's what, so the first thing came to mind was, let's do blockchain. And, and we as, as, as researchers fell into the trap of saying, okay, it's gonna fix that, without really taking a step back and saying, I think to answer Uli's question, maybe we should go to the business units and say, what are you trying to solve? Where, whereby, if I give you data of where the asset is, what condition that asset is in, for example, the flowers, and do I get paid based on the fact that even though I can trace them from Mumbai all the way to Rotterdam, perhaps the refrigeration unit crapped out, excuse my language, in the middle of, of that, 
And why should I get paid for those flowers now that I have the data on the condition of the flowers? So there's a whole business case that was just created by the fact that we knew where the asset was, the condition of the asset, and now who gets paid. Nick talked about the documentation, and I, I, and I remember doing his, uh, one of my early projects, um, doing spare parts um, across the world for, for a textile engineering firm in, in England. And the bill of lading paperwork was just phenomenally complex, old fashioned, whether it be computer generated or handwritten. But the validation process, it's insane about the, the amount of time it takes and the amount of cost that blockchain and AI and IoT does to that. So, so where, where I'm going is, Nick and I chatted briefly yesterday. I was thinking, oh, here's a technology solution because I can figure out because it's, it's slow, I can see how to implement the infrastructure. And it comes along and goes like, well, wait a minute. This is exactly the, the opportunity here where we, we lay upon a business process that's old that now can be digitized and through the technology. And I think we in this room shouldn't be looking at the technology solution as the first case. We should be looking at what's the business solution first and then go back into it. And, and then I think where that then leads to is the business changes. <laughs> because what when you change your process um, to fit the technology, you then go, well, actually, hang on, there's a whole new business I can run out of yeah. this. And actually, hang on, isn't there a derivative product I can create out of this? Or, you know, whatever you're in, um, there's, another, there's another product in a new business. So um, I think th there's a whole series of things we can talk about there. But, you know, moving to the fast, um, when you talk about financial services, uh, Vernon was telling me yesterday when he was... Um, wearing his financial institutions hat, you know, at the end of the day, all the major banks have to balance their books and then report to their um, central bank that they're good. Um, and that, that process, what you were saying, State Bank was, you had to do it in 15 minutes? 15 minutes. minutes. Yeah. When, the when the market closed, we have to settle all the trades um, for, so that the pages in the Wall Street Journal had the net asset value of all the stocks. If we didn't get it done in 15 minutes, the Wall Street Journal would call up and say, we can't go to press. So you have pages and pages and pages of emptiness. Yeah. Can you imagine what you'd do when you open up like, I don't know what the, I don't know what the stock price is of, yeah. of, you know, of a particular asset or equity, rather. So, uh, and then there's a regulatory framework above that as well, where, where depending on which jurisdiction you're in, you're reporting to your central bank about where you are at the time. And again, there's, there's penalties, or you have to borrow money at higher rates from the central bank to balance at the end of the day. Um, and then you look at major financial collapses like Lehman's, Enron, all those stuff. Can you imagine if that whole system had been built on blockchain and the regulator could see what was happening in real time? When you actually wash out Lehman's, Lehman's was solvent. You know, at the end of the day, the, the uh, uh, insolvency of Lehman's, there, there was money left over. But the problem was you didn't know who was holding what. You know, we, who was holding the baby is, is effectively what killed it because nobody knew who had the risk because the, the financial products were so sophisticated and they'd been cookie-cutted 20 different times to t 20 different people and then sold to retail bankers in Germany. Um, you just didn't know what was really happening. But if you had an environment where the regulator was on the node, was one of the nodes, and they had viewing rights or override rights and certain things, then you'd actually have a very efficient system where the, the process could be seen and you would reduce some of those risks. I think you reduce the risk, sorry, you reduce the risk because you'd always be in compliance at every point um, yeah. of the transaction. Yeah. Yep. Now look, I, um, Nick, I, I, I do want to take the opportunity to delve into couple of other industry um, use cases and examples that you've seen out there, but I want to take a step back into the marine industry. I mean, we, we talked about that, especially because we've got a couple of key stakeholders here from that sector. Um, so, you know, we, we, we looked at the Maersk example and, you know, Watson, Farley and Williams, I mean, you, you guys have a history of being a specialized marine firm as well. So, is it from, from the engagements that you're having on the subject of, you know, when we talk about convergence of IoT, AI, and blockchain, and smart contracts, mm. is it just the likes of Maersk that 
basically are coming up with um, the viewpoint to take advantage of this? Or are you seeing lesser sort of um, the lesser known brands as well, or the ones that don't really come in the most innovative companies out there? Are you seeing some of them? your customers saying, hey, how do we get engaged in this process? Yeah, it, it's, it, it's across the board. I, mean, I think in, in an old industry like shipping, when you talk about the bill of lading process and just the, you know, what you have to do with a bank, um, it's actually being driven from both sides of the equation. The banks are driving it and the, um, and, and the shipping customers are driving it. So on, from the bank side of things, I think um, the uh, Louis Dreyfus example was involved ING and Sockgen, and they reduced the time it took them to clear a transaction and the payment from three days to three hours. Um, just from an, a pure efficiency point of view, um, you can do so much more. Uh, business will drive much faster. Um, and then uh, on, the, on the shipping company side, all of the shipping companies can see it. It doesn't matter whether you're a containerized cargo or a dry bulk or your liquids. Um, the, uh, the security point um, actually becomes a factor. I was having this conversation with an oil trader the other day, and he said, oh, I hate blockchain. I said, why do you hate blockchain? And he said, well, you know, the bill of lading we can change. I said, what do you mean you can change it? And he goes, well, you know, sometimes stuff happens and <laughs> basically he was implying you know cargoes go missing or trades need to be changed because they you know wanted to do something slightly different and you can change a bit of paper blockchain it's a hard record and yeah you can change it but you can see everything that happened um, and then just from a pure fraud point of view some of these big big cargoes of crude oil the captain will stop off in a port somewhere and uh, you know the the 200 million dollars of crude you thought you had, um, some, some of it gets siphoned off and the bill of lading gets changed and it arrives with the correct cargo, but you're uh, slightly lied. And that's why the traders said they hated it. Um, when you think of that from an owner point of view or a customer point of view, actually you want to go down to that blockchain thing because it's just going to stop that fraud. It's not going to stop fraud because um, you know, if, we, if we think of the Enron example, Enron would have still happened because they were really dodgy and they were hiding stuff. Um, blockchain, you know, they still would have done all the trades they did. They were hiding their limited partnerships and who was really owning it and all the rest of it. It would have still happened. But you would have been un able to unravel it a lot faster because you would be able to see what's going on. Um, so it's not the panacea of all ills. It'll just improve business process. Uh, yeah. Can I just add yeah. a couple of sure. points? You know, one is that, that, that Nick said something that was very subtle. Uh, going from three days to three hours. Um, think about this: if you're uh, if you're being paid in a certain currency, and you're vulnerable to that currency over three days, that could that could make or break the profitability of that deal. And um, so the whole whole idea of settlement and reduce it is customers love the the fact that well most customers love the fact that they're going to be paid in what they were promised and not a, a currency exchange fluctuation. Yeah. That that's something in the financial services industry that's very, very important to be able to do that. Um, and the second point is, again, something that, that Nick mentioned that uh, subtly, is that even though it's a financial transaction, if your back-end systems aren't connected to your block, blockchain systems effectively, then how do you know what your position is in terms of, of the asset, in terms of, of the, the whole um, manufacturing process, as you, as somebody who may perhaps is, is in soya beans or, or, or flowers or what have you. So remember, this is a, this whole part of digitalization. I always think you can't do these things in, in isolation. You really have to do them in, in, in a complete collaboration inside your company to have these systems working together. That is not easy. That, that is, you talk about the age old industry of, of shipping. People inside IT just don't want to do those changes. It's a lot of a lot of work because what they hear is, I see an ERP part two in my in my career, and I don't want to be doing 20 years of, of deploying ERP systems that never get uh, the efficiency. So there's a whole digitization transformation process here that that's underlying underlying um, what Nick is asking. Yeah. 
So, so look, I, I think there's, you know, as, as, you, as you pointed out when, when you started off in the morning, you talked about everyone has, there's probably 35 different variances of definitions of IoT. And I think if we ask people around blockchain, it'd be the same. Yeah? And, and there's, also, there's also a big crowd that puts a negative connotation to, to its blockchain because there's all this talk about you know, Bitcoin trading and all of these things, right? Yeah. But obviously there's a lot more behind that, a uh, lot more in terms of what blockchain really is all about and, and as opposed to speculative trading of you know, virtual currencies. Yeah. But just from an industry standards, because you know, every industry has different things, is there enough being done from a regulatory standpoint and what, what do you think needs to be done um, to, to regulate um, this across various industries? It's an industry-by-industry answer, and it's a jurisdiction-by-jurisdiction answer. Um, I think when you talk about traditional industries like shipping, financial institutions, shipping doesn't really have a lot of regulators. Um, financial institutions, huge amount of regulation. Um, when you go around the different regulators in financial institutions, they're all moving at different speeds. Uh, MAS, probably moving faster than most. Uh, the European regulators moving, but not rapidly. US regulators, Vernon's probably got a better view on that. But you, know, um, you look at the comments around cryptocurrencies from some of the regulators and, and some of the financial institutions, and it's, it's slightly disturbing that some of them uh, don't get it, and they link uh, Bitcoin and blockchain as one and the same thing which it clearly isn't, um, and uh, I, I think there, there's a whole education process that need, needs, needs to happen. Uh, I think it will be driven from uh, industry up into regulator. Um, there's some really interesting conversations going on about where you end up uh, in financial institutions um, and, and regulations. Does the US dollar get uh, replaced by a uh, a, a, a crypto US dollar, um, and you know we we uh, we move in, a, in the electronic world with um, cashless payments in a in a Bitcoin style US dollar type of currency. You could see us heading that way. When you think about um, old legacy systems like the SWIFT payment um, uh, system, um, SWIFT is just a messaging system. It's you know. I've got a million million dollars here that needs to go over there and get converted into this, you know, and, and the messaging. The money still moves um, bank to bank through through the transmission to the different um, corresponding accounts. Um, but if you combined SWIFT and the movement of money into a blockchain environment, and the cash was some kind of uh, token, not not a cryptocurrency, then actually you start becoming way more efficient than that. Um, but going back to the regulatory point, um, it needs regulation. You have some interesting questions around data privacy. You have some difficult questions around competition law. Um, if I'm in, in a blockchain environment, who is actually getting that data? Is any of that data commercial secrets? Is any of that data actually market sensitive information. Um, I start putting market sensitive information out there and sharing it with my competitors within a blockchain environment. Have I just breached most of the anti-money laundering and competition laws around the world by creating some kind of cartel? Um, so it, there's, there's a lot of thinking and what needs to go around um, how you regulate that. And I think the answer is we probably already have all the tools to do that. Uh, because we, we as commercial counterparties interact with each other all the time and we protect ourselves. We have NDAs or confidentiality agreements. Uh, we have very clear rules around what commercial information we share and how we share it and who we share it with. Um, so when you come into these blockchain environments, you will have to have closed loops. Um, you, who, who's allowed in on that particular transaction? The the distributed ledger for that transaction will only be shared with the counterparties and possibly the regulator, depending on where you are. Now, that doesn't mean <coughs> the disaggregated data can't be shared across the whole of the node, but within that private space, 
the, the, the commercial secret information has to be shared in a, in a very uh, defined way. Now, how you achieve that, I think we already have the tools to do that. It, it's just making sure that when you structure the arch architecture, that it's talking to its talking in a way that doesn't share across that information. Um, and that then, that comes to that interoperability point. It's, you know, we, we're not in a VHS beta world. You know, it, it's, we're not going to, everyone's going to say it's VHS. There's going to be a whole series of systems. Um, the key question is how they're going to talk to each other. And then the, the next question is the data that's created from those systems. How is it shared? And what, how much visibility is going to be able to be seen? And I think the, uh, that visibility question is just going to depend on what in which industry you're talking about, what you're talking about. You know, are, are we talking about a container of flowers moving from Kenya to Rotterdam? Or are we talking about some very sophisticated financial product? Or are we talking about the fact that um, a particular trading house has gone long on crude? Um, and it, it's going to depend. Yeah, so you know, on that, if you think about uh, from a from a reg regulatory standpoint again, regulators have to, to to make this happen globally in a seamless manner. You'd need regulators across different industries to come together. So, for example, in shipping, you would need cohesion between the shipping regulators and and you know the, the financial regulators. And then you've got lots of different markets. I mean, it's hard to get governments now to talk to each other mm. without changing their opinions every other day yeah. about what they thought of the other government had done in yep. various aspects. So how do you see that cohesion? I mean, is that not necessary to have that cohesion to, to make this? Um, well, uh, um, it is a global phenomenon, right? It is a global phenomenon. But if you look at a, a jurisdiction by jurisdiction approach, and you don't, and you, you agree we, we're not having a one, one solution fits all technology, we're going to have different pots. The question comes is to the interoperability point. And if you're moving a container of flowers from Kenya to Europe, um, you've got the Kenyan government, you've got the Dutch government, you've got the flag carrier, the, the, the government of the country that's flagged the ship, yeah. you know, Panama, Liberia, Marshall Islands, um, and you have where the counterparties to the transaction are, because they're not in Kenya and they're not in the, in the, in the Netherlands necessarily. And then you have the banks. And all of that now happens anyway, and we create 200 documents. So I, I think it is, yes, we need a level of cooperation between governments, but it's not that much more than what we currently have for international trade. Um, I, I think it's the key ones will be the, the banks, because yeah. the, the, bank, the bank regulators need to go three days to three hours. You know, that's, that's something that's good. And actually, by the way, we can see what's happening because we're on your node as well, and you know we 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 can we can cover that. Um, I think customs authorities being on, on the node as well, knowing that it really is a shipment of flowers, not a shipment of hashish, yeah. you know, um, those types of things, and 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 that level of confidence. You know, customs authorities already have huge data sharing uh, cooperation arrangements anyway. Um, and I, I think the international banking system, again, there's fairly good cooperation. Um, and it's, it's just moving that level up and uh, the acceptance of the technology in, in a way that everybody's comfortable with. That, you know, it, I go back to the, you know, we're not having cartels, we're not having anti-competitive behavior and all that stuff. So it's, it's, yeah, embrace the technology, but remember, you still got to jump through the hoops. Great. So last question. Last question from my end, um, Mike. Um, from, a, from, from your industry standpoint, I mean, ha, has this changed how your industry operates? Uh, and, and what has changed in terms of, um, I guess, uh, being competitive in your own industry vis-a-vis, mm. -vis, you know, law firms have built off reputation, which <coughs> all of you guys have. Um, how do you sort of differentiate yourselves in the industry, with, especially with all of this disruption taking place in the market? Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's, we, we all know it's coming. Um, we, we can, we can, uh, the, the, you know, the, uh, Aaron was talking about it from a, a, a medical profession point of view, and it's the same point in law. Um, our industry will change. Um, 
when I started out as a, as a corporate lawyer, I was taught by doing due diligence. I did due diligence after due diligence after due diligence, and that was a long, long time sitting in rooms with bits of paper and lots of files and trying to find the hidden uh, clause that was going to stop the deal happening. So whether it was a change of control or, or whatever. Um, now, with, with, with AI, a lot of that information will, will be able to be discovered very quickly by applying um, AI to things. So it's those sm smart due diligence tools. Um, that's nearly there. Um, and, and litigation e-discovery has been around for a very long time. Um, in m and it's coming. The competence levels aren't great. But if you take it from an assisted AI point of view and say it's a, it's a tool that's going to speed up my job, then, yeah, it's, it's nearly there. Um, if you say, I want to rely completely on the report, no, it's not there. It's, we're talking 60, 70% confidence levels. We still got to have the human level of interaction. Um, where we are possibly heading, uh, and this is where you know, the, um, the Watson experiments uh, become interesting, is I know the answer to certain questions because I've got over 20 years of experience and I've done deals all over the world and you ask me a particular question because I've done it 20 times, I'd tell you the answer in five minutes. Um, if all my knowledge and the knowledge of all my colleagues could be put into a, a Watson and you could interrogate it in the right way with the right AI solution, you'll get a far better answer than I'll ever give you. But no law firms are going to share their databases. It's proprietary information. Um, and again, our regulators, we have to keep things confidential because we're obliged to. Um, so there's, there's that part. And then I think the final bit is the actual contracting part. Um, when we do an M&A deal under English law or Singapore law, we're talking 100, 200 pages of documentation and quite a lot of negotiation. Um, there's probably five points we argue about in most M&A deals over and over again. Um, and if you had the right data sets, you could work out the risk of certain things happening. So. The biggest argument tends to be around a tax indemnity. Are you going to give a tax indemnity or you're not going to give a tax indemnity? If I had a data set that said the last 20 deals with this mixture of jurisdictions in this sector, no one ever claimed on a tax indemnity, you'd give it tomorrow. Um, or you'd insure against it because you can insure against those risks. Now, that changes the way you negotiate. It becomes a risk probability equation and you actually need an actuary, not a lawyer. Um, and that point, it's a tick the box exercise. So you're doing a M&A deal, you want the tax indemnity, um, your counterparty goes away, checks it, says actually there's fairly high chance that I'm going to have to pay out on this given our circumstances, but you can have it, but it's going to cost you 10% more because it's going to cost me 5% of that to go and insure that risk and I'll take 5% upside. Now, that completely changes the way you negotiate a deal. Um, we're not there yet, but that that's where this type of, particularly AI, will take us to. Yeah. Um, <coughs> look, I, uh, I realize we're a bit over time already. I just wanted to see if there was any question from the floor for, for Vernon and Nick to um, close off the session. Um, anyone from the marine sector? Uh, Kenneth. Kenneth from MPA, so uh, regulator for marine time. But I think the one thing that regulator does, at least for Singapore, is to step back and say, you know, let the blockchain for EBL works. So we are trying out with, uh, you know, like APL, PIL. But I think what we will foresee a problem is interoperability. Because the, the bank will start to say, well, if I start liasing with APL, then next PIL not on my door, next MERS not on my door, then I'm going to have a lot of uh, chains uh, so I think that's, uh, that's what we're trying to do in terms of uh, a framework for interoperability. Mm -hmm. The other one is the legal framework, which is the, the law, because the transaction, Electronic Transaction Act now doesn't recognize uh, negotiable instrument. Uh, and so we are trying to work with the AGC to put a you know, legislation act to recognize uh, uh, negotiable instrument. So, so that are the roles that I suppose the regulator can do, right? 
my, my the other comment is that the blockchain is, you know, to a lot of marine time companies seems to be a solution, but it's actually a technology. So the differentiation between solution and technology becomes a bit confusing, right? So when they hear about that, well, good, you know, I want to buy a blockchain, and so what, is, what do you use the blockchain for, you know? I want to buy that solution, okay? And so, so that, that awareness and education on what, how can we enable your processes? Because now you have to identify the processes, and it's a hard work, right? Because now, in the past, you buy a solution, you just get your own staff to implement it, you make the change within your organization. But blockchain will require them to start identifying your ecosystem stakeholders, uh, bring them onto the table, talk about the smart contracting, you know, and then after that, re-engineer the process. Uh, although the benefit is very attractive, right? Because I think uh, from our experience, when we do blockchain on ship registration, the biggest uh, benefit is about cutting away the checks and the validation. Because the, the to and fro to the ship owners, to the shipyards, is uh, taking a long time. And that is the seven days, 40 days. Yeah. And that is, the, uh, that is the amount of time that you cut. Because if it is really from source and system do the auto trigger, actually that is uh, really forcing everyone to go digital. Yeah, yeah I mean that, that whole authentication, uh, know your client, anti-money laundering checks, all that sort of stuff. What you can do with you know, a verified identity in a blockchain environment, that's, that's really quite powerful. I mean, when we onboard a new client, we're obliged to go through know your client, anti-money laundering checks, and, and that's a paper intensive process. We, our compliance team has to verify what, what we're receiving, uh, uh, and frankly, it's slightly annoying. Um, because sometimes you just want to get on with the deal. If you had something that was internationally recognized of a, this is who I am and I'm a verified person, or this is this, is this ship and you know, it's registered here and it's a real ship and it's not something else, then that's, that's going to trigger all sorts of other changes um, in, 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 in systems and processes um, where the efficiency uh, gains will be huge.